Today with fellowship together and the good food that has been provided by the brothers and sisters. I used to say just the sisters, but a lot of times the brothers get involved in it, and so we appreciate the effort of everyone. I'm sure that in the course of this day, you have heard this phrase. If you stopped at the gas station and you went in to pay for your gas, when you <coughs> left, the attendant said, have a good day. If you went through the bank teller, the bank teller, after they have done your transaction, will say, have a good day. If you go down to Walmart or you go up to the grocery store, it doesn't make any difference. It just seems that this phrase is spoken several times throughout the course of a day. Have a good day. And in return, you will say, you too. And we want people to have good days. We want people to be able to enjoy their days. And, and uh, we realize that our world is filled with a lot of things that sometimes hampers that. Maybe sickness, maybe monetary problems, maybe work-related problems, or whatever the situation is. We, you know, we find that it's difficult maybe to have a good day. But I'm going to suggest to you tonight that it's within your power to have a good day. You don't have to have a miserable day. You don't have to have a lousy day. You have it in your power to have a good day. In fact, the Apostle Peter, he mentioned just exactly how that you can do that. Now, let's look at this passage of Scripture that is found in 1 Peter, the third chapter, verses 9 through 2, 12. He said, Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. And that's what a good day is, I think, is inheriting a blessing or having blessings bestowed upon us. He says in the next verse, For he that will love life and see good days. That's exactly what we're talking about. Having a good day. If you will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So tonight I'm going to share with you some thoughts that Jesus gives us, at least, on this idea of having a good day, being able at the end of the day to say that I have accomplished everything that I set out to do, or at the end of the day, saying that I am a little better than I was yesterday. At the end of the day, being able to say that maybe I've reached out to someone and shared the gospel with someone that day. That certainly would be a good day. So there's just a lot of things that will accumulate. And so my title to my sermon is, How to Make Life Work for You. You know, sometimes we let, we let life work us. And if we woke up, we woke up this morning, you know, with the rain showers and and those who were planning on having picnics today and those who are planning having activities outside and so forth, I'm sure that their day didn't start off too good. It wasn't a good day for them. But you see, you can let the world dictate to you your day or you can dictate to the world your day. You see, I, irregardless of, uh, of whatever you know takes place, I'm going to have a good day. Now, I'm sure that you've seen this expression if this, I seen this back when I was about 16. I guess I got my driver's license. They had, back then, we didn't have Walmart. We had uh, Ameses. I don't know if y'all ever had any Ameses down in this country, but we had an Ames store. And so I went to the Ames store, and they had on the end of one of their rows, they had all these, these uh, uh, pictures. You know, they were just kind of... You, you hang them on your wall and they just kind of drape down. They were, they were rolled up in a scroll and, and you could buy it. And there was one there particularly that just really stuck me, struck me uh, fancy. And it said, uh, it, was, it was a picture of a little girl and she had golden hair and she was running through a field and it was a field of daisies, you know, and there was blue sky and just, it was a beautiful picture. And the little girl was running through and supposedly this is what she was saying. Today is the first day of the rest of my life. And I love that. I love, I've seen it since then many, many times, but I always thought that that was kind of a neat thing. Today is the first day of the rest of my life. And I've added a little token onto the end of it. Today is the first day of my life, and nobody's going to mess it up. Okay? Let's just let's, let's, let's make that, that our, our, our every morning, you know, devotion to God. Today is the first day of my life and I'm not going to let anybody mess it up. But see, we let people mess it up. We let 
the people at the workplace. We let the world mess it up, and you have it in control. You can do something about it if you really want to. All right, let's go on. There's uh, many people have trouble making life work, and you will know that because of the expressions that you hear from people. Oftentimes, and how many times have you heard things like this? Nothing seems to go right. Have you ever made that statement? No, nothing seems to go right. Everything I do just falls apart, or I, you know, I fix something and it doesn't work, and on and on. We get that feeling. We hear that oftentimes. Number two, we hear life is just one problem after another. And to some people, it appears to be that exact way. Uh, some people say, nothing's going in my direction. Some people might say, I can't win for losing. And then here's one that we often hear. I take one step forward and two steps backward. So I never get anywhere. I never make any acceleration. I never get to go ahead anywhere because I'm always in the same place. Uh, have you ever seen the, the comic strip, The Born Loser? <laughs> I, you, well, I don't read the paper anymore. I don't know if anybody even gets the paper anymore. But, but you know, it used to be the first thing you'd read when you got the newspaper was the comics. And they had this one in there called The Born Loser. It seemed like I associated with him every time. <laughs> you know, just he, every, there was always something happening. And, and, and so life is like that. It, and, and, but so, so many people have trouble with this. The question is, people will try, or the, 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 the solution is, people try to solve their problems in many ways. When they have problems, they go about it and think, well, now this is going to fix it up. Drugs and alcohol is one of those uh, supposed solutions to all your problems. And so people who get, you know, uh, maybe uh, psychotic or, or have uh, even psychological problems, they turn to drugs. Because under drugs, they forget all their problems. Uh, there is a, I don't know what this, what that medicine was, that shot was. I had a guy one time in my shop cut his finger off on a saw. Honest, he did. He said, I cut my finger off. He was one of those guys that always kidded you. And I said, you're kidding me. And he held it up and he wasn't kidding me. And so they took him to the hospital and they gave him a shot. You know what I'm talking about? That shot that uh, uh, it's, it's a dope. And I said, is that supposed to take away the pain? The, the nurse says, no, so it just do, he doesn't care about the pain anymore. <laughs> so drugs does that. It gets you where you don't care about the pain anymore. It's there, but it, 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 it never takes it away. And alcohol doesn't take it away. Because once you get off the drugs, and once you get off of the alcohol or the effects of that immediate you know, thrust that those things give, the problem is still there. So it doesn't work. There's also psychological and self-help movements. A lot of people, and I don't, if, if I offend any of you, I'm sorry, but a lot of people go to psychologists to solve their problems. I, personally, I think we're going to the wrong place to solve our problems. I think our problems can be solved by God and by the Word of God and, 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 and living that life that Peter said, you can have good days and you can be blessed. But they turn to psychologists, and most generally the psychologists will tell you it's your mom and dad is the reason you have this problem. Or it's your wife is the reason you have this problem. Or it's your husband the reason you have this problem. I, I, I imagine sometimes they might even get to the point and say it's your kids the reason you have this problem. <laughs> See, that's what psychologists do, though. They, instead of, uh, of saying you have the problem and you need to fix this problem, they blame it on everyone else. There is also the, the yoga thing, you know, people did that meditation thing. I, I would be in great pain. I'd have a problem if I got into some of them yoga positions. But that supposedly you get into that position and you meditate and, and all your problems go away. Uh, there's the New Age movement, mysticism. And, I, and I, I just added this one here, the weird diets. Isn't it true that almost every diet will tell you how good you will feel if you lose this amount of weight, and you can lose this amount of weight, this amount of weight in 20 days or 30 days, boy, that makes you feel good, doesn't it? So you starve yourself, and and you you go on this special weird diet, and sure enough, you uh, you lose the the 20 pounds or whatever it is you're trying to lose, and next week you put it all back on again, so your troubles are still there. So all these weird, fascinating diets. You see, and, and everyone, everybody, every doctor will tell you, you know, a diet is only good as what you make it to be. It's not the changing 
of the diet of what you eat. It's changing the way you eat it and what you eat. It's a mind thing. It's not the intake of the food, it's the mind thing. Of course, we realize that through the mind thing, we cut down our portions and we eat the right kind of food and so forth. So, you see, we try to fix all of our problems with things like this, with diets, with uh, drugs, alcohol, psychology, and so forth. And really, all these things are, are band-aids. They'll fix it for a little while, but the problems never go away because you've never dealt with the source of the problem. And the source of the problem is you. You and me, we are the source of the problem. And we determine whether or not we have a happy day or whether we're going to be miserable today. All right, life doesn't work because of several things. I think to some people, life does not work because they don't know what their real purpose for living is. In fact, I've had people tell me, that, what is my purpose in life? <coughs> you know, we have just a regular unusual job, we go to work, we come home and so forth. And so what's my purpose in life? When you forget your purpose, you can't enjoy life. But let me tell you, the Bible is clear as to what your purpose and my purpose is. Here it is in the book of Revelation, the fourth chapter, verse 11. Read it carefully. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were, were created. When I remember my purpose in life, to bring God pleasure, then I will have pleasure myself. I think that's my purpose, to bring God pleasure. He created, by his pleasure, he created me for his pleasure. And when I have that in mind, life works out. Because God will bless those who bless him or who serve him. Secondly, there are those who are blinded by the God of this world. He has tremendous power, Satan does. He is, he is the God of this world, according to 2 Corinthians 4. He says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. I, I think we would all agree that Satan is the God of this world. Uh, Satan told Jesus one time when he was up on that high mountain, he showed him all the kingdoms of, uh, of the world, and he said, all this, the glory and everything that's in them, I'll give you because they are mine. Satan said, they are mine. He said, I'll give these things to you if you just fall down and worship me. Well, Jesus, of course, said, you know, get behind me, Satan. And he said, it is written, you know, that thou should serve and worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So, you know, it, this, this God of the world makes you think that if you're not rich enough or you don't have, you know, the, uh, the, the Nike uh, sneakers or if you don't have all of the name brand clothes, you, you can't be happy. That's what the world tells us. That's what the God of this world wants you to think. That if you are underprivileged and you don't have maybe a good home life or, or maybe, you know, you don't have the education or the knowledge that someone else has, that you can't be happy. That's not true. But the God of this world has deceived so many people along that line. All right. There are those who are not following the instruction manual. And this will cause you to have all kinds of problems and difficulties. The instruction manual for us, I believe, is the Word of God. But each and every one of us fathers and grandfathers, we've been down this road where we went and bought the kids a swing set, or we bought a wagon, or we bought a bicycle that needed some assembly. You know, that, that word right there, sometimes it just really gets you, some assembly. And so you get this box that has all the parts in it, and here's a bag of bolts and washers and nuts, and here's these parts and this parts. But, you know, we sometimes are so proud, we don't need instructions to put a bike together. Who needs instructions to do that? Who needs instructions to put a swing, swing together or a little red wagon? You know, so the instructions are the first thing you take out of the box and throw away. You just toss them. And then finally, when you get it all together, you find out it doesn't work and you get all frustrated because you forgot to put this washer on first or you forgot to put the right mold in here and so forth and it doesn't work because you didn't read the instruction manual. So you get frustrated. 
This is the way it is in the spiritual life as well. We get frustrated when we don't read the, the, the instruction manual because he told us what it was. He said all the scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So we are instructed in righteousness. Why? So that we, the man of God, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And if, if you are perfect and thoroughly furnished unto everything that you need, uh, if you're not happy, then I can't do nothing for you tonight. That will make you happy. You can have a happy day when you follow these instructions. Uh, another reason why people are having a bad day sometimes is they're trying to walk in their own steps. And we can't do that. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. So when you think that you know what to do and you don't have to take any advice, especially from God, or take any advice, you know, from mom and dad or from the teachers or, or whatever, you're going to mess up. And, and life isn't going to be as full as it possibly can be if that is the case. So don't try to do things on your own. But here is the main thing. I'm going to dwell mainly tonight on this right here, that the reason that life isn't working for us sometimes and we're not as happy as we can be is because of our own attitude. Our attitude is everything. And you have to go about it with the right attitude. You know, sometimes people come to church so grumpy and, 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 and they look like, you know, that just life has just burdened them down. Well, you don't have to do that. You can come to church happy and jolly because you have the option to do that. Or if it's even to work and so forth. In Acts the 8th chapter, verse 21, we've used this little story throughout this week. But it, it, it is uh, applicable to so many things. And I think it's applicable right here. This is the case, you know, of the man who wanted to buy the Holy Ghost off of Peter. He offered him money for it. And Peter told him, you know, he had neither part nor lot in this matter. He says, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. And so our heart has to be right in the sight of God. And that boils right back down to us as individuals as having the right kind of heart. Uh, you know, an humble heart, a happy heart, a, a thankful heart. There's where it comes down to. And if that is the case, I'll guarantee you will have a blessed day. Let's look at attitude just a little bit more. Our attitude is one of the major factors that determines what kind of life we're going to live. Attitude is the process of you controlling your mind and not letting your circumstance control your mind. As I said a little bit ago, when we woke up this morning, the rain, the dreariness may have controlled our mind. But you can overrun that with your own mind, the way of your own thinking, that you're not going to let that. You can wake up with a bad hair day. And it will, it will uh, uh, direct, you know, cause you to have bad feelings all day long. Well, you don't have to do that. Your attitude, you can control your own mind and your own life. I've always loved what Abraham Lincoln said. You know, this man... I've read several books about him, and this man, I'm just, uh, I am so impressed with him. He lived through the Civil War in this country, and that must have been quite a depressing thing on him because he had to deal with trying to save the nation and so forth and, and try to bring unity uh, uh, back to this people. And, and, and all this was going on, and he was running this country and dealing with this war. And not only that, but he had one of the worst wives I guess I'd ever heard of. Her name was Mary. And, and, and she, was, she was just terrible. I'd hate to wake up every morning with her by my side, too, because of the way she was. She was just so jealous and so, I don't know, it, it, it just something about her. Just her, You know, you wouldn't want to associate with her. And Abraham Lincoln had to live with that every day. Not only just all the problems he had in the country, but Abraham Lincoln said, he said, I have been about as happy as I've made up my mind to be. <laughs> he had to be that way. He, 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 had to, he had to take things in control and say, I'm going to be happy today, and this is going to be a blessed day. If he didn't, he would have got so depressed, and he would have, he would have uh, just been a miserable man. Our gratitude should be, as I mentioned a while ago, this day is going to be the first day of the rest of my life, and nobody's going to mess it up. In talking about attitude, I sometimes use this example, this little illustration. is a story about a man by the name of Andrew Carnegie. 
or it could be Carnegie, I don't know, it's Carnegie, I think. Anyway, Andrew Carnegie was a Scottish boy that came to America, immigrated. He had little jobs here and there as he went along, and finally, because of his ingenuity and because of his attitude, he became one of the richest men in the United States, and this was back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and so forth, you know, uh, a long, long time ago. And he, he got his wealth in the steel business. He was one of the biggest steel manufacturers in the world. And, it, it, and I believe it was over around Pittsburgh because, you know, that's an area over there that, that even has a lot of things attributed to his name. But anyway, Carnegie one day was interviewed by an interviewer because at one time he had 43 millionaires working for him. Now that's not unusual today, I suppose, for a big company. But back in that day, back in, you know, the early 30s and 40s and so forth, to have a millionaire, to be a millionaire was something else. I mean, that was unheard of. And yet he had 43 of them working for him. And so an interviewer came to ask Mr. Carnegie, how is it that you're able to hire are able to have 43 uh, millionaires in your employment. He said, they weren't millionaires when they hired on with me. They became millionaires because of what they do. They became millionaires because I knew they could. And so the interviewer continued to ask the questions, well, how is it that you could find 43 men that were worth paying a million dollars? And so he went about to explain his rule of philosophy. He said it's like gold mining. He said the prospector goes out into the mountains to mine gold. He takes his little donkey and he takes his pick and his shovel, you know, and whatever food he's got, and he sets up a claim and he goes out there and starts digging right in the middle of the earth for gold. He said in order for him to get that gold, he said he may have to remove tons and tons of dirt to get to the gold. But he said he never goes looking for dirt. <laughs> he always goes looking for gold. Every morning, he gets up with the hope and the anticipation that there's gold in that ground. And he works and works and removes everything he can to find it. See, we, we don't do that sometimes. We go looking for dirt. We go looking for the dirt in people's lives. You see that on Facebook. You see it, you know, in the, in the, in the media world and so forth. If you can find anything on anybody, well, we got to post this. We don't do that in the church sometimes. Sometimes when we are evangelizing in the church, people come in and we start looking at the dirt, first of all. We start looking at the thing that's wrong with them and this that they need to change and so forth and so on. Instead of realizing we have a piece of gold here and a piece of gold that needs to be cleansed and needs to be purified from all of its impurities. Even gold itself has to go through a lot of, of a hot fire. It's like 2000 degrees Fahrenheit in order to remove all of the impurities so that you have pure gold. And so Mr. Carnegie did that. He said, when I'm looking for people, he said, I might see people that, uh, you know, are, are filled with things in their lives that I don't like. But he says, I know there's something there. They've got an attitude that they're always searching for something better. And, and so he was able to have these men, 43 of them, millionaires working in his company because he was always looking for people who were looking for gold. Well, something happened. <laughs> Let me go back So it is a known fact that the more good qualities you look for to people around you, the more that you will find. Your attitude will determine your altitude. Your attitude will determine, again, how happy your day will be. The prodigal son, the change that came in his life was attitude. He, you know, he took his inheritance, he left his father's house, he spent all of his inheritance and wasted it on righteous living. And finally, when he had nothing left, he's down in the hog pen down there feeding the hogs, would have ate the food that the hogs ate. And it was there that he finally came to himself and he changed his attitude. He said, my father has in his home even hired servants that are living better than me. 
And so he said, I will arise and I will go back to my father and I will say, Father, I've sinned against you and sinned against heaven and no more worthy to be called your son. That was his plan. That was the changing of his mind. That was the attitude that he had. And even at that point, it, 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 nothing would have happened except for the next verse that says, and he arose because of the attitude that he now had. He arose. So he went back to his father and, of course, he, uh, you know, repented and, and, and told his father he was sorry. And we know the rest of the story there. The Apostle Paul, he said, I barely thought that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And he set out to do that, persecuting the Christians, hauling them off to prison and, and even watching uh, some being put to death. But he changed his attitude. And when he changed his attitude, he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And yet prior to that, he was trying to eliminate and destroy Christ. But now he's everything to him. So it is all a matter, I think, of changing your attitude. Knowing that we are saved, I think, will certainly help us to make life work for us. And I, 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 I want to really impress this upon you. I think tonight that every one of you need to know if you are saved. Can we? Can we know that we are saved? Paul spoke with assurance of his salvation. He said in 2 Timothy 1 and 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. It wasn't a doubt in his mind. He knew what he had committed to Jesus, that he had committed his soul, his life, and he said, I know he's able to keep it until that day. In 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, he said, For the time I am now ready to be offered, the time my departure is at hand, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So, you know, he, he had some confidence in him. And I want you to know that if you've got that confidence in you tonight, you can have a happy day. Knowing that if whatever happens in your life, whatever might happen unexpectedly, that all was well with your soul. Paul knew that at any time he was going to be taken off this earth. But that's okay, he said. He said, I know there's something better for me. That'll make you feel good. Now, how can we know that? Let's go to the scriptures. Paul gave the key to the assurance of salvation. So that we can leave this building tonight and we can know if we are saved. And, and of course, not only that, but we will have to depend on the grace and the mercy of God. I understand that. But we can know that in our own life, we are saved if we leave here with this key that Paul gave. And he stated it in Romans, the eighth chapter. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They, he did not say they might be the sons of God. He said they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We can call God Father. That, that makes me have a happy day, knowing that God is my Father. Now, God is God of all the creation, but he's not the Father of all creation. He is the Father of those who have become their children. And we as Gentiles cannot be the children of God as the Jews were through the seed of Abraham. We are adopted into that family. And some of you know what adoption is. When you are adopted, you become a part of that family. And there are blessings that are associated with it. Then he said in verse 16, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's the verse that I want you to really look at. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit. Now some religions will tell you that God has revealed it to me that I am his child. Or God has spoken to me and so forth. That's not what this verse says. It didn't say that God was the only one involved here. He said God's spirit and your spirit bears witness with each other. And when that witness is true and when that witness is the same, it, it, there is an evidence there that something is happening. And in this case, the evidence is that we become the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. All right. Let's put this to a test tonight. The spirit of God equals our spirit. And our spirit, of course, is our, just our entire 
uh, concept. It's, it's the will that is within us, just as the Spirit of God is the will of God. All right? So let's make two columns here. The Spirit of God on the left and our spirit on the right. The, the Spirit of God says to hear the Word of God. I think you know where that comes from. Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 17. Faith, which is impossible to please God without. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, only you know, you see, this is a one-on-one -on -one text. Only you know whether or not you've heard the Word of God. Only you know that. So over here on this side, your spirit can declare if you've heard the word of God, you've heard the plan of salvation, and you know Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for you, and that we must submit ourselves unto him in gospel obedience. If you have heard that, then you can say over here, my spirit bears witness with God's spirit. I have heard the word of God. So I am one step closer to being saved. I don't believe I'm saved yet at that point, but I'm one step closer because my spirit bears witness with his spirit. Secondly, we know that we must believe the word of God. Mark 16, verse 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, I don't know whether you believe. This is something that really gets personal. I don't know whether you really believe what you've heard. But if you do believe what you have heard, and this is what God's Spirit says to do, and your Spirit says, I believe, then once again, you are bearing witness with the Word, with God's Spirit, that you do believe. There's a next thing that comes into play, and that is repentance. When Peter was asked the question on the day of Pentecost, what should we do? People who wanted to, 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 to change their lives and to have eternal life, Peter said, repent and, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So we know that repentance, which is a change of life, a turning of our lives, we know that repentance is essential. I don't know if you've repented or not. I don't know. Only you know. Your spirit knows whether you have. You can deceive a lot of people, but you can't deceive yourselves in your own mind. So you know whether or not you've repented. So if you've turned from your sins, your spirit bears witness with God's spirit. God's spirit says to repent. You said, yes, Lord, I have repented. I'm another step closer to salvation. And then there is this confession that is made. Romans 10 and 10, associated with Romans 10, 17. He said that with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. In Matthew 10, 32, Jesus says, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my father, which is in heaven. In the case of the, uh, of the Ethiopian eunuch, he made that confession. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I guess this is something that everybody hears or would know about you, but only you know whether you, you were telling the truth. So if you have made that confession, doing what the Spirit of God tells you to do, you are bearing witness with that. And then baptism. Baptism comes into play. In Acts the 22nd chapter, verse 16, 1 Peter 3 and 21, where he says, Baptism doth also now save us. It was what Jesus said would happen if we believe and are baptized. And so baptism is something that the Spirit of God tells you to do. And if you have been baptized for the remission of your sins, then you can go away from this building tonight and say that I am saved. Now, if you continue to turn from that and you go back into sin, then that's another story. But we can know if we are saved. And I'd make sure before the night's over, you know. I'd make sure that, I, that, that my spirit would, would intertwine with that spirit. You know, living your life based on the Beatitudes will make life work for you as well. There are those Beatitudes that are referred to in the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, that I'm not going to go into tonight in great detail. But each one of them, you know, had to do with, you know, if you are poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is yours. Uh, just a number of them. There's eight of them there. And, and as I said, we're not going to go into them in great detail here tonight. But, but, but Jesus said, blessed are you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness and so forth and so on. And the word blessed simply means happy. 
So to have a happy day, I would advise you to go and to look at all of those particular things that are recorded there in Matthew 5. Uh, I'll just pick out one of them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It doesn't seem right, does it? It doesn't seem normal that if you are poor in the first place, that you could be happy about that, especially if you're poor in spirit. But the story, I think, unfolds in the case of another situation that is in God's word, and that is where you had these two men that went into the temple to pray. And uh, the one man was, a, was a, a Pharisee, and the other man was a publican. And the Pharisee had considered himself, you know, right up here at the very top of the ladder as far as spirituality was concerned. He goes into the temple dressed up in all of his attire. He goes to his special seat. God forbid, you know, that anybody gets in my seat. Uh, or, or, you know, that's the way sometimes church members are. And he had his special spots, you know, there in the, in, in the temple. And he went there and he went through all this motion and I suppose all the pageantry that was associated with it. And he began to pray to his God. He said, God, I'm thankful. Uh, and, or, well, he, first of all, he didn't say anything about thankfulness. But he, he, he said, first of all, he said, Lord, he said, I have fasted. I have tithed. I've done all these things as much as to say, Lord, you ought to be glad that I'm on your side because look what I have done for you. And then he says, I am so thankful, Lord, that I'm not like other men. You know, he's already puffed himself up as being the greatest for God's service. So he says, I'm thankful that I'm not as other men are. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, he, he begins to name out a few people and he sees this publican that has come into the temple to pray as well. And as he uh, prays, he says, I'm glad I'm not like this man over here. I guess that made him feel good to put this man down who was a publican already, you know, chastised and disliked by all the Jews because he was a tax collector. But he said, I'm glad that I'm not like this man here. And then Jesus tells about the prayer that the publican prays. And he not so much as even looks up to heaven, but he beats himself on his chest and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said that man went home justified rather than the other. And why? It was because that man was poor in spirit. He realized he was nothing. He realized that, that there was nothing he had done that would contribute to his happiness, that would contribute to him being able to, 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 you know, deserve something from God. And so just God be merciful to me, a sinner. I say that tonight that in order for you to be happy, sometimes we have to empty ourselves of ourselves and just consider who we are in God's view. We are sinners that he will save. And we are sinners that he will bring to heaven with him in that home that he and his son has prepared for us. You know, years ago, we had a 4th of July meeting in Austin, Texas. This had to have been about 1972. I had to have been about 17, 18 years old, I guess. There was a young man, Brother Steve Robertson, who was Larry Robertson's son and we were the same age and so we were to give a little talk that day at this fourth of july meeting in austin and i'll always remember steve's talk it impressed me so much at that particular time in 1972 we were going through what was called the hippie movement remember some of you don't remember this but some of you do the hippie movement where all the boys wanted to wear their long hair you know and and uh, just, and it was, yeah, that's what it was. It was the hippie movement. And some of our boys in the church were doing that and they were wearing the long hair. And I mean, it just upset the leadership like crazy. And, and so, you know, when anything like that happens in the church, I mean, we, we jump on it and we stay on it. And every sermon you hear is on that one subject, isn't it? That's kind of the way we do things. We just kind of stick with it and, and you're not doing any good about it, but we're going to preach it anyway. So, you know, every sermon you heard was about boys' long hair and, uh, and, and that it was a sign of rebelliousness and all of this. And, of course, these boys were the same age as me and Steve. I didn't have long hair. I had, a, I had the crew cut on top. 
But anyway, Steve made a statement in that sermon that I've always cherished. He said, he said, brothers, he said, if you want to take something out of people's lives, make sure you've got something to put back in. Because when you take things out of people's lives, it creates a vacuum. And something else is going in. So make sure you have something to go back in there with. And I think it had to do with attitude. I think they were dealing with the wrong thing, with, you know, whether or not, you know, the boy ought to go and cut his hair. You change his attitude, and he'd cut his hair. In fact, that same boy that was dealing with, he's going to go get him a job, and he cut his hair because he knew he had to go through an interview. Well, you know, why wouldn't you want to do that for the Lord as well? But it, it was an attitude thing. But, you know, be careful in what we do as far as the church and our teaching program. You can teach against something so long, but make sure you've got something to put back in there to replace it with if you ever get it out of there. Because the devil will be there to put something in just, you know, as bad as what you're dealing with. So uh, that's just, uh, I, I'm not going to charge you any more for that little bit of information. It's just, it's just uh, some good information right there. So tonight we're going to end our sermon with a, with a, a song, an invitation song. Uh, I've given you the plan of salvation here. We can know as we leave this building here tonight whether or not we are uh, saved and are a child of God. And you need to see whether your spirit and God's spirit agrees to the same thing. If it does, then, then you've got a happy life. You've got a happy day knowing that at the end of the day, regardless of what happens to us, we will be saved. Have a happy day. We're going to sing a song. For those who have never obeyed the gospel, those who have obeyed and wish to repent, and wish to come forward, and, with, and, and we'll pray for you and with you. Let us stand and sing the selected hymn, The Great Physician. What a great song as we're talking about healing so that we can have happy days.